Well, welcome to worship. This is a very different way for us to be doing worship. Uh, in this time when we have this COVID-19 virus, we have uh, closed our actual physical worship service. So there's only a few of us here this morning, but we are here ready to assist you in worship. So um, we pray that uh, this will be a real blessing to you in, in this time. It's different for sure. But we pray that you're sitting around in your lounge room or wherever you are, that you can join in and participate in this truncated worship service today. In our gospel reading that we're going to hear this morning, we hear Jesus say, I am the light of the world. And John tells us, as he begins his account of Jesus, that the light came into the world and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. And today we're going to hear the story of the man born blind who is healed by Jesus. The metaphor moves from darkness and light to that of spiritual blindness. So may our eyes be truly open today as we worship Jesus Christ, the light of the world. I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer as we begin our service. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we can gather, whether it's in the worship of a congregation, whether it be in our homes, wherever we are, we know that we can worship you. And so we offer up to you this day, this time of worship. May you be glorified, Lord, in our praises and in our hearing. May we be edified. May we be built up as we break open your word and hear what you might say to us today. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to invite you to join together in song with us. We're going to sing a hymn which is a, 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 a real faithful old hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. If you know the words, join in. Otherwise, just um, have a listen and we'll do our best to, uh, to lead you in worship in song this morning.
assisting me in leading the worship this morning. And thank you to John on the other side of the camera this morning. You don't see him, he's just like he is at a, at a, a newscast. And um, you don't see them, of course, you just see the people behind the desk. We're going to now move to a prayer of adoration, followed by a prayer of confession. I invite you to join me in prayer. God, Creator, Almighty Father, the Great I Am, from the beginning without end, Alpha and Omega, the Holy One, you gave us yourself and the Son. In humility and awe we bow before you. Jesus, Son of God, Saviour, Lord, Light of the World, Miracle Worker, Healer, Sight Giver, we lift our hearts to you in worship, giving you the glory due your holy and exalted name. You revealed the Father's love. You showed us the Father's compassion. You reached out and touched. You restored, you made whole. And when your hour had come, you offered your life as a sacrifice for us. Holy Spirit, brooding over the face of creation, presence of God, comforter, sustainer, convictor of sin, the one who walks alongside, we rejoice in your presence and power. Holy Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit, we offer up this act of worship and we pour forth our praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we bring now our, our prayer of confession. And this, this prayer of confession is based or inspired by Psalm 23. Let us pray. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But, O oh Lord, we are consumed with wanting more. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. But, O oh Lord, other pastures seem greener. The waters aren't always still. Our souls still thirst. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. O oh Lord, we long to be led by you, though we may complain along the path. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And yet, O oh God, we do sometimes fear, particularly in times of trial and turmoil. May we feel your presence, your comfort and your forgiveness in you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. O oh God, sometimes we refuse to sit down at your table. Forgive us and help us to see your overflowing mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Forgive us, God, and lead us into your house. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to turn, we're now going to turn to the, to the scriptures and Graham's going to read for us from John chapter 9. It's actually verses 1 to 41, but we're going to break that up into three parts this morning. And John, I will, uh, John, sorry, Graham's going to, uh, to read from John 9, 1 to 12. And then I'm going to share uh, something on that and then we'll return back to the next passage of scripture. So it's over to you, Graham. John chapter 9, 1 to 12. Jesus heals a man born blind. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am the light of the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him, be begged, asked, seen him begging asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. 
Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. There is a saying, there is a saying, isn't it? There are none so blind as them that will not see. And it fits beautifully, I believe, with this cleverly crafted story in John's Gospel about the blind man whose sight is restored. There is more to the story that meets the eye, if you'll pardon the pun. For those who come regularly to Mudgery Bay Uniting Church, you'll recall a couple of weeks ago that we looked at the story of Nicodemus and we saw how John played a lot with the theme of darkness and light. And John's Gospel is quite different from the other Gospels in that John just does, does not just tell the story of Jesus, he theologizes it. In other words, he writes in such a way that we don't just learn of the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus did. We actually get a picture of why Jesus? Why Jesus? Who is this person? Why did he come? So in this story we see the theme of darkness to light continued Although now it is presented as moving from blindness to sight. Jesus is walking down the road with his disciples when they spot this blind man. He was begging, for that would be the only way that he could survive. Society had actually pushed this man to the margins. And his physical condition alone would have prevented him working, but it is more than that which keeps him on the streets. The reason why is made obvious by the question that the, the, the disciples ask of Jesus. Whose sin caused this man to be like this? Was it his own sin or was it the sin of his parents? Well, if he was born blind then we could hardly uh, be blamed on him, could, would you think? But in Jewish thought, as we learn in the Old Testament scriptures, a person's ailment was believed to be the result of sin, either your own sin or the result of the sin of your parents. And it has its origin in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, where the Lord delivers the command to Moses and says that the children of sinning parents would be punished to the third and the fourth generation, although it doesn't specifically state that this punishment would be in the form of physical ailments. But nevertheless, this was the understanding of the cause of sickness and ailments at the time. And while it is true that we recognise that there is a link between sickness and sin as a result of the fall, we are not so quick today to individualise specific sins with, with specific sin. Certainly we do not condemn or ostracise such people, although maybe we did with the AIDS and homosexuality in the early days. In any case, back to the story at hand. Jesus does not get caught up in this conventional linkage between sickness and sin. Rather, he sees this as an opportunity to reveal God's glory. Immediately we see Jesus, he spits on the ground, makes a bit of mud and places it on the man's eyes. Gee, I wonder if the man actually knew what Jesus was doing, what was being placed on his eyes at that time. Note that in this instance, the man does not even ask to be healed. But he does as he is told and he stumbles off and he goes to wash the muck off his face in the, pot, in the pool of Siloam. And hallelujah, praise the Lord, the man born blind for the first time in his life can see God's mighty works have been revealed. Or have they? Or have they? There was mass confusion amongst the locals. Is he or is he not the man who used to bother us with his begging day by day? Yes, I am that man, the former blind man kept saying. But still the locals didn't believe or refused to believe or couldn't comprehend. Had they stereotyped him so strongly, so profoundly as the blind man to the point where they could not conceive him now in his new condition. Instead of glorifying God and recognising God's work being revealed in this man as Jesus had intended, they seek to investigate further. Now I wonder, a question for us to ponder. What might be your response? What might be your response? Would you readily accept this as a miracle? 
Or would you be prone to analyse signs and wonders? Think about that for a bit. Okay, so we're going to go now to the next part of this story, and uh, Graham's going to read for us from 13 to 34 in chapter 9. Thanks, Graham. The Pharisees investigate the healing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees who asked him how he had received his sight, he said, he, said, he put mud on my eyes and, wash, and I washed and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still, not did, still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? Well, we know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind. But how he can see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Ah, so the plot thickens. The plot thickens. The religious heavies are brought in. What do we say? Thank God for the tradition and the wisdom of the religious establishment. Imagine what might happen if we didn't have those safeguards to protect us from all this weird and wonderful stuff that we see going on. There's always an explanation for everything if we'll only take the time to do a thorough investigation. Well, first up there is a check on the credibility of the healer. Aha! It's the Sabbath! This happened on the Sabbath. Therefore, whoever has done this thing could not be from God because God does not allow healings on the Sabbath. Hang on a minute. If this fellow isn't from God, he must be a sinner. And how can a sinner then do such miraculous things? Oh dear, the camp is confused and divided. How did it happen, they asked the man. The man explains that the man whose uh, name is Jesus put this mud in his eyes and told him to wash it off and now we can see. It's simple as that. Oh, so seeing you can now see, they, uh, they say, what insight can you give us to who Jesus is? Well, he must be a prophet, is the reply. Even though the man once blind now sees is standing right there in front of them, nobody, it seems, in this company believes his story. Perhaps he's faking his blindness. He probably wasn't healed at all. The man's parents are then summoned. Is this your son, they ask? Yes, that's our son, right enough. And yes, he was born blind and we can see that he can see. 
how he now sees it, well, that's a mystery to us. But hey, listen to us, we're just ordinary folk and we don't want to get involved in this, so we don't want to get into trouble, so why don't you ask him what's going on and leave us right out of it. So for the second time, they, they challenged the man, come on, buddy, speak the truth. This guy who healed you, he's a sinner, isn't he? Come on, just admit it. Look, I don't know too much about sin and sinners. After all, you never let me in the synagogue on, or the temple on account of my condition. But uh, hey, one thing I know, that I was blind and now I can see. Go figure. Hey, I think you guys, I think you guys might have been his disciples too. <laughs> well, talk about sticking it to them. That sends the hairs up on the back of their necks and all they can do is denigrate and ridicule the man and, and eventually they toss him out. I mean, what a nerve this fellow has to challenge this orthodox faith, a tradition handed down from Moses many, many years before. <sighs> well, thank God we in the church are not like that. If you want to do a miracle, hear God in our, in our company. If you want to reveal your works through some supernatural means, well, we're ready and we're waiting. Or are we? Or are we? Are we expectant of God to move among us in a mighty way? Do we anticipate a miracle or two or more? If not, why are we as we are? Something else for us to think about. So we're going to move now to the last little bit of this interesting story from John's Gospel. Thanks, Graham. Spiritual blindness, John 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me, so that I, I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Hmm. So at the end of the story, we see how incredibly clever the story is. This is not simply a story about a healing, no way. For John, this is actually a metaphor for all that Jesus is about. Jesus came to do something very simple, to help people see the world in a way that they've never been able to see it before. This is actually a story about those with eyes wide open and those with, as they say, eyes wide shut. This is about who will recognize the Messiah and the work of the kingdom and those who will reject the Messiah and dwell only on the earthly kingdom. Who is in the light and who is still in the dark? Who can truly see and who are those who are blind? The Pharisees are onto something here. Surely you do not presume that we are blind. Is that what you're saying? Surely not us. After all, we are the devoutly religious people around here. William Willimon uh, tells the following story. Through her surgery, sorry, though her surgery was terribly painful, disfiguring and difficult, she made it through. She found a whole new life for herself, a new dignity and sense of mission. Her recovery was rather miraculous. In fact, that's what she called it, a miracle. God gave me the strength and the hope to go on, she said. Willemont says, I was there when she said that to two of her friends. God gave me the strength and the hope to go on. One friend said, you've always been a strong person. And the other one said, I don't know anyone with a stronger sense of self than you. Willemont comments, isn't it curious how the confession God miraculously gave me the strength and the hope to go on is regarded as some kind of threat. It is of the nature of a miracle to be an intrusion, a dislocation of the expected and the explained. Rather than say, wow, that's interesting, in the face of the miraculous, we are conditioned to say, 
Let's get all the experts together and explain what happened using the conventional, conventional socially acceptable modes of explanation, okay? Isn't that really what happened in the story of this blind man? Here we have a man who was once blind. Now he can see it, and nobody seems to take the time to wonder, to give thanks and to celebrate with him. I mean, the poor guy. No one seems to be excited about the fact that he can now see. The whole thing is turned into an intellectual problem to be solved by reassuring themselves that they're okay and it's business as usual in the temple and in the synagogue. The organised religion institution carries on as business as usual approach, but blind to the things of God that are happening right before their eyes. By the end of the story, we see that not only has the blind man received his sight, he has come to understand that Jesus is more than a healer, that he's more than a prophet. But the Pharisees end up being more blind than the blind man has ever been. Can we learn anything for ourselves from this? What scares me personally is that I see too much of myself in the attitude of those neighbours and the Pharisees. I am more the sceptic than I'd like to admit. I want to analyse first and believe later. And I wonder, I wonder if you do likewise. I trust that we'll have the courage to be open to God doing the miraculous things in our lives and around about us and, and among us. And beyond us, because I guess in reality that's what happened in this story. A little scepticism isn't a bad thing. We, we do need to be discerning, but let's not limit God to our understanding. After all, the God who created the universe, surely, surely he can do just about anything he would like, wouldn't you agree? In this time of great uncertainty over the coronavirus, it's all too easy for us to let fear and anxiety and even panic overtake us and consume us. And I know that verses like Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 remind us not to be anxious about anything, bring our concerns to the Lord, but gosh, gosh, I personally find that really difficult to leave them there, to leave them with God, to trust God completely. Now these, these are difficult days. These certainly are difficult days for us. And in times like this personally, we should not dwell too much on the negatives. It's too easy to find the negatives. We shouldn't do that, but we should remind ourselves over and over again of the positives. Cling, cling to the hope of the gospel. The assurance that the Lord is with us wherever we go and whatever we're going through. It's been really interesting to see some of the responses from Christians. Some claiming you know, to be covered with the blood of Jesus and some claiming the promises of 91 that, Psalm 91 that none of these diseases will come near you and Psalm 41 that says you know, the Lord sustains you on your sickbed in your illness. He will heal all your infirmities. And maybe I do not have enough faith or maybe I am too much of a sceptic. But the reality confirms that we don't always get the desired out to our prayers. Or the verses we claim to cover us for our protection don't always deliver. But for what it's worth, this is what I claim to. I don't fear death because Jesus has already conquered it. And on the other side is the blessing of eternity. In this life, Jesus has me covered. He has my back, regardless of my earthly state. And if he does that for me, he does that for you. He does that for you. So hold on to that. Cling to the promises of his word, even when they appear remote or unrecognisable. And draw strength from one another. Uphold one another. Encourage one another through this time. Look out for one another. Pray for one another. Get together on the phone. Whatever. Pray for one another through this time. And let's see what God can do. Let's see if God won't, in fact, work a miracle in our lives. Won't work a miracle in our church, in our community. Let's be trusting God. Let's not be too fearful. Let's always remember to look at the positives. Look what God has done in the past and see where God is going to be with us in the future. Trust God in all that you do. 
Let's have our eyes truly open to what God might do. God bless you. Amen. And we're going to turn once again to a song. And the song is a well-known song. It's a more modern version of the song. Amazing Grace. It talks about, of course, being blind and now being able to see.
Open our eyes to the needs of the world and having opened them, lead us to pray and to act that healing may come and justice be done in your name for your glory. We pray, Lord, for those affected by the coronavirus. I guess that's all of us in one sense. But, but for those who are sick, for their families, for those forced into isolation, for the anxious ones, for the panicked, for the elderly in particular and those with chronic illness who are more susceptible. Lord, may your healing presence be around them. We pray also, Lord, for families who've lost loved ones and we pray again for your presence and your power to be very real to them. We pray, Lord, for all those groups that are remaining open, for schools, for, uh, for teachers, calming children, concerned about their own health, for the children themselves, we pray, Lord, especially for carers, for doctors and nurses and others who are on the front line this time. Lord, there is so much wrong in our world, at times it seems overwhelming, so much focus on the evil, so much prevents us from celebrating that which is good and noble, but help us, Lord, to look with fresh eyes to the beauty of the earth and the beauty that we see in people. And while we might have seen many examples of bad behaviour and aggression, there are many more examples of people who are loving and caring and caring for their neighbours and even for strangers in this time of need. So Lord, we pray that you would, you would knit our communities together. You would knit them together in love, O oh Lord. We pray this in the precious name of Christ, our, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're going to end our time of worship, I think, at that point. And um, we want to thank you for joining us this morning. And we pray that you will have been blessed for that. And we hope to be able to continue and improve the way that we're presenting these uh, messages to you, these services to you, particularly as we come, of course, to the very special time of Easter. And so from us to you, our blessing to you, and grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.